I am very honoured to be your voice to to be able Graham, to read I, your I, I words. Can't I can't stress enough how powerful your voice is. <laughs> it's when the I words, read, mate. The words you gave me were the words when you I gave me the story. You're laughing, you know. When I'm upset and sad, it sounds like you're sad. Um, so I, I'm just overjoyed. I couldn't. Have, I've never, I've never done anything like this before. I was learning the ropes as we were going on. You, you were, great, you were great to guide me in every step of the way, which is brilliant. I just can't thank you enough because, like you say, when I was listening to my story, your story, your voice, how well and professional you are. I was like, bloody else is a good story, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it's mine. <laughs> I wonder what happens next. <laughs> As a child, I was always fascinated by the concept of superheroes. The ongoing battle of good versus evil. Superpowers. Amazing gadgets. Different personas. And secret identities. This concept transcended with me into adulthood and helped me mould my own persona as a soldier. As a soldier, my uniform was my armour, and whilst in uniform, I would act and feel differently than how I would without it. This was evident in the late summer of 2003, when I was driving through London towards Wellington Barracks. It was the early hours of the morning when I witnessed a brawl across the street. Suddenly, I felt a tightness across my chest and began to become nauseous. I was having trouble focusing my vision whilst driving my car, but was too afraid to stop. For the first time in my adult life, I was feeling genuine fear. This fear was overwhelming. I was having a panic attack. I was 24 years old, a section commander in the British Army, an infantryman who had completed three operational tours of duty and a few months earlier I was leading my men to war in Iraq. Now I felt naked and vulnerable without them. I was afraid. Where was my uniform? Where was my armour? It would be over a decade later until I experienced these horrendously painful feelings again. And it was no coincidence that it happened at the same time as ISIS was invading parts of Iraq. However, along with the anxiety and panic attacks, I was now also experiencing bad dreams, nightmares and flashbacks. I would experience heat and smells from blasts and would wake up disorientated and confused. It was June 2015. I was still a serving soldier, but at this point, not for much longer. I was due to be medically discharged in the August, as the result of a spinal injury sustained in Afghanistan several years earlier. I was fortunate to be self-aware of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in myself and immediately sought help from the very institution that was accountable for them to begin with. However, I was left woefully and bitterly disappointed with the treatment that I would initially receive. First of all, lovely to meet you. After being inside your head for a couple of weeks, uh, it, is, it is good to finally meet. Do I call you Paul or James? Uh, I answer to both. I, I prefer Paul, to be honest. You uh, do, but your, your official name is James Paul, just like McCartney. Yeah, for, yeah, just like McCartney. Yeah, you, but you, but you use... I talented. <laughs> I don't know about this. That It's a, uh, it's a cracking book. It really is a, a hell of a read. Uh, and an emotional read, and it was such an honour for, for me to do it. So thank you very much for choosing me to be your voice in this thing. Um, what I liked about your voice, Graham, in particular, was um, you can add volume and gravity where needed. And there was a few times we spoke about when we were messaging each other online that I caught you laughing a little bit as well. 
Right. Oh, it did. Well, some of it's funny. I mean, it is, it, it is a, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but the audio book for me was a roller coaster of emotion. Um, you talk about some pretty serious stuff, but then there's also some, shall we say, high jinks that uh, lads get up to when they're uh, when they're under pressure, <laughs> uh, and it's and it's all covered in there. Um, so what I've managed to do on here is I've managed to get the two photos from the cover of, of Blake. Basically, I've I've split the cover up into three pieces. Can we quickly talk about the photos then? Because for a lot of people who were buying the the book version, they'd see them. What's this photo above me of? Uh, the first photo above there, that's myself, uh, a bloke in the book who's known as uh, Pez. Um, it's on the outskirts of Basra in 2003, just, it's probably about six or seven days before we actually commenced the Battle of Basra. And you can see a burning oil well there in the background. And without giving too much away about the book, that's where we came under some intense artillery fire. And um, yeah, it's, it, it, it brings back a lot of memories just looking at that picture and I suppose it's where a lot of the issues for a lot of the boys in the book regarding PTSD originated from. And then moving on to the picture on the top right, that's in Nadi Ali South in Helen Province in Afghanistan in the winter of 2010-2011. And we've gone from there and there's a Taliban com a compound in the distance. I'm just observing over my sights with my general purpose machine gun, also known as the Jimper. Yeah, which I had to learn to say right, didn't I? I think I... <laughs> did I call it the Gimpy, I think, at first? I, I, I think you did as well, uh, the Gimpy. But this week's a learning curve, isn't it? Because I've, I've tried to write this book for the wider audience, not just for veterans. Yeah. So, but that's why... We, but with certain terminology, you take it for granted. Yeah. And I think we can look a few times throughout uh, this relationship, I suppose. Yeah, well, I, I, as I said to you, I said, look, you know, because if blokes who have actually served, if they hear that, it'll just be like, whoa, you know, I've got to get it right. So, uh, but you were very patient with me. I think it was only a couple of times, but that was one of them, I remember. Uh, we had to get the, uh, the name of the kit precisely right, because I want people who listen to the audio book to believe that they're listening to you. And... If I do that, then I've done the job right because they're your words, they're your experiences, it's your life experience. I'm just the guy reading it out, but I've got to try and get it across the way that I think you would want it to get across. So that's, I've got to get the terminology right. You can't have a soldier getting the name of the machine gun wrong. I mean, you know, you lose all credit. Yeah. First of all, you've done an absolutely fantastic job. To, to the extent that when I was listening to our audio book now, because it is our audio book, I'd actually forgotten that I'd written it. Really? <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, it, it was like, I was so engrossed in the story, I forgot it was my story. Because the <laughs> way you read it, you just you just have in every letter. And and second of all, it's, it's more, for me, it's more sort of like our story for the men who went through this 20-year journey with me. Yeah. Because it's very much their story as well as mine. Yeah. And it is, it's an amazing story because you've had an amazing life. And that's why it's a cracking book. Now, lots of people who've had interesting lives say they're going to write a book. Oh, I should write a book. Or people tell them you should write a book. But you actually went that extra step and you went and did it. What was it that pushed you on to go, no, I am going to turn this into a book? Yeah, great question, Graham. Um, the first thing was... Uh, my experiences through the aftercare that veterans are receiving on discharge for, for the, from the, the forces, whether that's the Army, Navy or RAF. And second of all, what the big push was, um, a fellow Irish Guardsman committed suicide last year just before Christmas. And within a battalion, you know, there's probably 500 people. But this, this young fellow was in uh, the same company as me. We served together. We didn't particularly know this uh, young lad, and I'm not going to mention him. Uh, but he was in two company Irish guards and what really stuck with me was he had the same birthday as me and that kind of gave me the kick up the backside needed to sort of tell our stories, what we go through and why we act and more personally feel the way we do on discharge. So, I mean, in the book you talk about some horrific scenes that you witnessed firsthand and would have felt in a lot of ways responsible for whether you were or you weren't you, you were part of 
of what was going on in these places. And we're specifically talking about Afghanistan, Kosovo. We're talking about Iraq. We're talking about Northern Ireland. Pretty much all the, the main hotspots that the British Army were involved in uh, during your time in the service. What is yeah, it? Absolutely. What is it that that you that you? What is what ha what happens to a person that goes through all of that? And what do the MOD need to do to deprogram people when they reach the end of the their service? I think when you look at my peer and it, it, sort of like I call it the modern generation of war fighters, the, what we went through from the progressions from the the conflict in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland was horrific in the seventies and eighties. By the nineties, it was it was on it was, it was on a downhill, on a downslope. But then came obviously Kosovo, and as a young teenager on my second tour going to Kosovo and witnessing the first hand genocide and the worst what humanity has to offer. That's what changed me as a person, and that's where the title of the book comes from: Life After Death, A Guardsman's Tale, because my life changed after witnessing so much death. And then as we progressed on to the Iraqs, like uh, we were the first into Kosovo, uh, my platoon, my battalion. And then by, some people said we have, my generation had sort of like this, this uh, blistering career because we, we were lucky enough, or fortunate enough from a professional standpoint to be one of the first into um, Iraq with Y Company Fusiliers as well. And it's what I call the darker side of warfare and the accepted calculated collateral damage a loss of civilian human life and that's what generally affects soldiers when they leave the forces because you get trained dehumanized reprogrammed to um to kill and command to closely engage the enemy especially the infantry now you cannot have an effective fighting force that also reflects society's values and standards because otherwise it wouldn't be an effective fighting force and we take a lot of casualties then obviously then in Afghanistan, um, you know, that fighting was very intense and that was almost on par what we'd witnessed in the war in Iraq in 2003. So everybody, whether they did one tour of Afghanistan, one tour of Iraq, one tour of um, the Balkans as such, on leaving the forces then, they've got to be some sort of de-escalation of that process to take from a civilian to soldier or some form of mental health awareness training to to revert you back to civilian life because there's a lot of soldiers now who are so angry especially with the close of afghanistan and the perceived yeah. failure there but i don't think we failed in afghanistan even being perfectly honest because you've got to look at the war aims in 2001 after september the 11th went in there to defeat al-qaeda and to obviously put a stop to bin laden we did that in 2011, but then the war aims at a political level, level get diluted. And then there's obviously the Anglo-American special relationship to delve into how we're just essentially an extension of US foreign policy, whether we like to admit it to ourselves or not. But yeah, to answer your question, um, there needs to be some sort of de-escalation and mental health awareness training on discharge, and then a substantial and permanent offer by the government rather than charities who are all drying up now and leaving my generation in particular um, with nowhere to go and suffering in silence with the mental health. That's what shocked me the most is when you explained that when you come out of the service, there is no, the only help is from charities. There is no, I mean, you guys have literally put your lives on the line for your country, but when you're done, you're kind of left to get on with it. It's, it's it's a national disgrace. You've only got to look at, really, the ongoing pandemic with veteran suicides at the moment. There's a group, Veterans United Against Suicide, and they're actively documenting, uh, documenting the suicide rates among, amongst veterans. They've won 53 alone this year. And with what's happened in Afghanistan at the moment, it's going to spike rapidly with the perceived Did, did you say there's been, there's been 53 this year? Yes, 53 this year alone. So when they talk yeah, about in the 20 year conflict in Afghanistan and they, they give this number of a 400 and something number of, of service people that, that died during the 20 years, if there's like 50 a year dying afterwards, that's actually more died after the, the war than, than died during it, after they came home. You're totally right, Graham, and it's that duty of care. Um... There's three types of PTSD. There's the initial, what used to be called um, shell shock in the First World War, where 
you know, the guys just freeze and it's kind of like the rabbit in headlights, which is, goes to a fight or flight mentality. They freeze and, you know, you're not conditioned. It's not, it's not natural human behaviour to kill another person. So the conflict of war takes its toll on that person in that very second. Then there's the medium sort of term effects of uh, PTSD. And that's when what was called in the Second World War, battlefield fatigue, where the guys were just emotionally tired, emotionally shattered. And then in the Vietnam era, they sort of identified the post-traumatic stress disorder, the long-term effects, which can manifest at the worst kind up to 20 years. So if you think about September 11th was 20 years ago this year, you've got a whole generation of, of, of soldiers now who've been bottling up maybe some of these emotions that they should have dealt with beforehand. And with what's happened recently, it's just going to let the genie out of the bottle and there's going to be a lot of veterans struggling, which is, is going to put such a demand on these overstretched charities as it is. But Help for Heroes Combat Stress, the Royal British Legion that sent us to war, the British government did. Mm. So they've got a duty and care and responsibility to give us and provide us with a, a permanent and substantial offer for our long-term mental health. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And it's a disgrace. Yeah. And and you you talk about that in the book, and it it all makes sense when you when you read the book like I did, or you listen to the book if someone decides to to get the audio book version, which is really what I, I want to talk to you about. But you know, if, it doesn't matter as long as the message gets through, whichever way you want to get it, you need to get this book, Life After Death: A Guardsman's Tale, and it is it's an audio book now. It's available at audio. It's dead easy to download. They'll sort you out at audio and you can even you can sign up and get, you know, a, a free trial and uh, you can get the book essentially for free. But if you're interested in this, but it, it's not just that it is the story of your life. And you grew up, sh should we say it was a challenging childhood in Greater Manchester that, that you that you experienced? Well, challenging is one word from from, from what my daughter in at, at, um <laughs> Uh, uh, compared to what my daughter has on a daily day basis, yeah, it is challenging. It's the polar opposite to what I grew up with. But because um, you grew up in care, got, essentially, didn't you? Yeah, I grew up with a predominantly Irish uh, family, which meant uh, a lot of drinking, a lot of violence. Uh, I was eventually put into a children's home within the care of the state when I was a teenager. Uh, I always knew I wanted to join the British Army, and it was like an, maybe a natural stepping stone progression because I was already part institutionalised as, as a young boy, if that makes any kind of sense. Yeah, it does, yeah. And, well, uh, I and... mean, uh, I've never brought, bought into the concept that you're defined by your childhood. Right. Uh, and I've always strived to improve myself, which is why um, now I'm a local elected councillor in um, Aberton, and I try and use my platform for two purposes. A, to improve my local community, but B, to also voice the concerns of the veterans community as well. Yeah. Yeah. And when you when you were first recruited into the army, because you talk about this a little bit in the book about the process. In fact, you were uh, you were a recruiter at one stage as well in, in your, the term of your your army career. What needs to change in the recruiting process to make sure they get the right people? Well, I think this goes back again to the uh, I spoke a little bit about recruit suicide and you know i'm not going to go anywhere near the sort of like uh, deep cut uh, what happened all down there many years ago but the, the, rec recruits are actively killing themselves as well so and you witnessed I, that firsthand didn't you on a parade ground oh yeah yeah i did when i was uh, 17 years old yeah and this goes into the almost mindset of soldiers that the fact that that was normal. We didn't even flinch, and I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. Any spoilers here, but um, the mindset of going from civilian to soldier. Um, so, if that would have happened as I was a civilian, the shock would have been there. The human, the emphatic, uh, the reaction, the human reaction. But as a soldier, we just didn't move. We just stood there. And we did as we were told. Um, so, yes, there needs to be screening before recruits touch live weapons to make sure they're psychologically uh, um, suitable and not danger, dangerous, dangerous themselves or others, but also on leaving the military as well. Mm. I don't think it's going to work in between whatever, how long a career a soldier has, whether that's four years, 10 years or 35 years. Because like I said before, soldiers need to act and feel 
and uh, respond differently than their civ than civilians because otherwise, if we had an armoured reflected society, then we'd get a lot more casualties on the battlefield. And so, when it comes to training soldiers, yes, you have to be trained in a certain way, but then yet again, there's a duty of care and moral responsibility to untrain them mentally and emotionally. And the key thing here is it emotionally. Because when I was a recruiting trainer, um, and I think the chapter's called uh, The Circle of Infantry Life, because it is an yeah. ongoing circle, it is a loop. Yeah. I was then uh, teaching the same training and behavioural methods that were used to condition me onto the next generation of soldiers. So I would scream at these guys, these young guys, 16, 17, 18 years old, you know, pain is weakness, emotions are weakness, suppressing you don't want to be weak. So then by the very default, in later on in life, if these guys do have emotional problems, they don't want to seek help because they don't be perceived as weak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're soldiers after all, yeah. And you mentioned in the book that where it affected you, the, there was the incident at, uh, when you were in Wellington Barracks in, in London and there was something went on and, and it... Uh, and you were affected by it, but the one that that struck home for me was your reaction to the Manchester bombing, which you had nothing to do with, but for some reason felt a responsibility. Can you talk us through how that, how you made that connection, and how it was related to the stress you'd been through in the military? Um, my mental health started to deteriorate, like I say, uh, after Kosovo and the death, the genocide, the inhumane acts that we witnessed there as a teenage boy. So I, I threw myself into work as a coping mechanism. Some people take drugs, some people, you know, uh, get into scuffles, some people drink a lot. And I did drink a lot as well to, when I was in the military as well to try, and, to try and cope with this. But when I left the military, I secretly knew that I had mental health instability and issues. But when the Manchester bombing went off and, and the Ariana Grande concert in 2017, that triggered my PTSD. But rather than admit to myself that I, I was struggling with battlefield trauma because that's associated with, associated with the military, my brain sort of, in a peculiar kind of way, almost made me feel responsible for the Ariana Grande, Grande, Grande uh, concert bombing. Um, which I'd rather take responsibility from that atrocity than admit that I had, I was weak from a battlefield trauma, which is absolutely bizarre. When you, when I say it out loud now, <laughs> you know, it's absolutely crazy. Yeah. Because I had nothing to do with that. Like and the, way, and, and the way you got there that. was you'd been to a concert like before the, the Ariana Grande one. You, you'd been to, I forget what it was. was it, Marvel it, Live. It was a Marvel, that's right, Marvel Live. You'd yes. been to that and on the way out, you, your soldier's brain clicked in, and you were seeing all the vulnerable, you know, points in the in the in the the exiting system from the venue. And then, when the when the bombing happened, what was the what was the difference in time between that experience and then the bombing itself? Uh, it was four months. It was four. Four months, months later, um, the bombing, and yeah. and you were like, if only you'd said something, you could have saved lives. Which is just, yeah, it's just uh, <laughs> you had nothing to do with. Yeah. Any soldier who exited that arena or, or have, has exited that arena, whether it's a concert, whether it's a children's um, event, they'll see the choke points, they'll see through, through training, you can see them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why a lot of soldiers don't like shopping centres, public places, because for them, all they see is potential vulnerable points or vulnerable areas where potential attack could happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, like you rightly said there, I saw these points I had a mini panic attack. I just wanted to get out of there. The soldier and me took over. And then I felt guilty for not mentioning that to anybody. Mm. But they got professionals who do risk assessments, who do security assessments. And it wasn't my job, wasn't my responsibility. But even now to this day, I still feel a lot of guilt. And no matter how much anybody will tell me it's not my, it wasn't my job, wasn't my responsibility, I had nothing to do with it. Unfortunately, that's going to have to stay with me for the rest of my life or not speaking up, not being vocal about it. Was the process of writing the book, because I think you wrote the book pretty quickly, I think it was like 12 weeks, I think you said to me in, in one message we had, backwards and forwards. Was the process of writing the book, Did that was that therapeutic? Did that help you through what you had left of, of PTSD, etc.? 
Um, PTSD doesn't go away, Graham. PTSD right. stays with you for life. You've just got to manage it. Um, I, I wrote a book in 10 weeks, including the Ten interviews. Weeks. And I put it down and then it, I, edit, I edited it. But while I was editing it, I wasn't actually reading it because I didn't want to engage with it. Really? Uh, you wanted to just yeah. leave it where it was? Yeah, was there so a feeling was, of once you'd written it down, you'd put it away in a locker kind of thing? That, like, I mean, emotionally. Yeah, yeah you, you t you're totally right there. And I had to do it in such a compressed time scale. I literally just locked myself away in the office for 10 weeks, buried myself in here and just, you know, for six, seven hours a day, just, just, just cracked on with it. But that's my own coping mechanism, how I manage my PTSD through work. Yeah. So yeah. kind of burying myself in work as such. Now... People have said to me, has it been therapeutic for you? No, it's had the, the worst effect on me. Has it? it is, uh, yeah, I'm back in therapy now. And the sad thing is that, you know, my wife said to me, you know, you, you struggle with anxiety, like Paul. And I said, yeah, I am. And she always can tell. She goes, put yourself back into therapy. So I did. Yeah. Nine months I've got to wait for one for one. One to one therapy is nine months. Right. Which is, it's, it's disgraceful. And when, when you think about it, because you've you read the book, you know what I've been through. Yeah. But what I found quite hard and challenging as well was some of the guys' stories who, and what they've gone through as well, are the ones who didn't quite, weren't able to sail the storm as such. Um, and when I started doing the research into it and interviewing the other guys, some of the guys I've um, seen for maybe in 20 years, I witnessed how they've been let down by the system, how they've been failed. And I call it, I think, call it in the book, the unpro unproductive prison of hindsight. Yeah. When I look back and think, red flag, red flag, red flag. Yeah. And you should never look back with the knowledge and wisdom you've got now or the tools you've got or experience you've got. But there were so many institutional and systemic failures within the MOD regards to mental health. Yeah. Um, like when we came back from Kosovo in 1999, no mental health support. We were just given a beer. And that's where it back. was. It was Kosovo. Was that where you with the morgue experience? Was that Kosovo? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that so was that was, that was. I don't want to give too much of it away because I think it's it's better to to, to get it through the audio book or if you want to read it in the in the print book and see see and hear Paul's words describing what it was like. Uh, I can see. I can't see how any normal person could come out of that unaffected, and you were just expected to. Yeah, and there's almost like a progression of, of mental health support that was made available. Like when it, when we, from like the early tours of Northern Ireland, Kosovo, it was very much a man up culture in the military. Yeah. Where you were given a beer and told to man up. And, you know, I hate that term these days, man up, but that, that was the terminology of the British Army at the time. And I, I do think what, what actually changed and evolved was the evolution of this, the mobile phone, and how. We can communicate better now, so everyone's more aware of what's going on in the world through globalization, the information age, and you know we can share our stories. But when you go to sort of like Iraq in 2003, we, we had to sign off on our own mental health. And this is where the guys in the front and back of the book, their mental health then began to deteriorate from what we witnessed and what we were we had to do over there. Mm. And then when you come to the late of tours, of like uh, it was quite funny because we went full circle. Didn't we? we were the first into Iraq in 2003. And we handed over Basra to a militia in 2007. But by then, they'd introduced something called uh, decompression Cyprus, where they essentially just put us on a beach for, for uh, uh, 24 to 48 hours and just let us get drunk. Yet again, no counselling, but that was kind of like to get it all out of our system before we came home. And then what happened from 2007 onwards was a process called TRIM, Trauma Risk Management, and then... That was introduced for Afghanistan. And then obviously when I got injured, I became a welfare officer for the British Army. And there were so many, like say, institutional failings in, in terms of mental health because the mission was always the priority, closely followed by the soldier's mental health. Right. Was it closely followed or was it a distant second? Oh, I'll say loosely followed. <laughs> <laughs> what the, was the... The mission was... always came... Came what first. was the one? What was the one where they their idea of checking if you were all right? You were coming out of a situation, and it may have been just before Cyprus, or it may have been in Cyprus. I can't remember. And you were all, as you went in, in front of each other, asked if you were okay. And you, oh, you that were was when we back from Iraq, back in two thousand and three. Right, lined us all up, and, and then there was like a small little tent. There's a doctor there and somebody else, and so there's no confidentiality whatsoever. 
And then once you signed off for your mental health, there's like a beach party going on with beer and music in the background. And I jokingly, because I've always been a bit of a clown, you know, I was like, I've never grown out of the old class clown scenario. And you, you probably tell that by all the jokes in there. And I caught you laughing a few times reading you it did. as well, mate. Don't think you didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, but seriously though, they lined us all up and it was a case of, are you feeling okay? Yep, sign here. And so there's a line of a couple of hundred people there. And the, so you can all I be heard. There's up. no confidentiality yeah, at yeah. all. It's, it's, a te- it's a tent. It's a tent. So I, I said to one of the lads, I went, watch this. So he said, right, Corporal Watson, any problems? I said, apart from the bed wetting and, night- and the nightmares, I'm perfectly fine. And he goes, tell me about that. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm having a laugh and a joke for you. And then, of course, the line's held up. Everyone's heckling me. It's, it's, it's one of them. But was that a sub- subconscious cry for help? I don't know, because that following summer, I did have a panic attack. So yeah, maybe subconsciously it was. Yeah, yeah. But how are they, if you really have got something, you're not going to open up in that environment. That's just, it's just, I mean, you made the situation absurd, but it was already, an, you, you made the situation more absurd because it was already an absurd situation. That's not how you, you check in with people and make sure they're okay. No, so, not at all. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's a it's a hell of a book, and uh, it's got all of your experiences in there about combat experiences. Uh, there's quite a moving one when when you ordered a strike and the helicopter. Uh, where was that one? Um, you that, you were under it. fire. I mean, so you needed help, and you and you called in the American helicopter gunship, if that's the correct terminology. I don't know. And that really turned around, didn't it, on its head? You went from, from jubilation of realizing you weren't getting shot at anymore to the consequences of what that helicopter had done. That must have been a hell of a thing to live with. Uh, well, I still struggle with this um, emotionally about the burden of command because every one of my men on, on that day have all suffered with a mental health since. Every one of them? And Every one of them has suffered a suffered mental health. Some of them have had suicide attempts. Some of them have been to jail. Um, some have been incarcerated pretty much for the past 12, uh, 12 years. Um, and what's heartbreaking for me was it was the right call. And if we were put in that situation again, I'd make the same call. Yeah. Knowing the ramifications down the line. Mm. Because, excuse me. Um, because what basically happened was the Americans, and I'm, I'm, it could have been, I'm, I'm not trying to put the blame on the Americans because they were just doing their job as well. But essentially, uh, we were getting engaged by a, a village to our front. I reported up the chain of command. An airstrike was called in. And it was a very kinetic airstrike where um, the whole village was decimated. We were in jubilation and we were high-fiving because we weren't being shot at anymore so we thought it was the best thing ever and then we were inundated with what i call a dark side of warfare which was all casualties of women and children with blast injuries and that stuck with myself and my men for the rest of their lives and when i talk about the burden of command it's something that i carry with me every day Mm. yeah which I think is is quite normal. I think that makes you normal. I mean, if you if you didn't carry that with you, you'd be a machine. And that you can't, you know, soldiers are human beings, and bottling it up, as you explain in your book, is not a good way to be, because it you have to deal with it sooner or later, and you want to deal with it in a positive way and not a negative way. And a lot of you guys have dealt with it in negative ways through substance abuse or. Or, or whatever it, it turns out to be. And it was just, for me, it was, uh, like I say, at the beginning, like I said, it was an honor to be able to to speak your words. And hopefully it will reach a, a, an even wider audience than the print version of the book. As, as the print, how long has the print version book been of the book been out? Uh, six weeks so far. But the, for me, the book's already been a success. Okay. It's already been a success because uh, before we, we spoke this evening, a veteran rang me up and he said to me, I've been struggling with mental health for 20 years and I've got more out of your book than I have done for the therapy Brilliant. that I've had for the past 20 years. He said, I've even let my wife read it and now she's got a better understanding of me now. So it's brought them as a family unit closer together. 
And I'll give you another example as well. You'll like this one, Graham. The fellow in the front of the book, I, I put it on LinkedIn. And he's a pipe fitter, this fellow. And he um, works all over Europe fitting uh, industrial pipes. So somebody recognised him through social media. I think it was LinkedIn. I couldn't be sure. And he offered him a job as like a site manager. Because they sit and they serve him on, on the cover of the on book. On the cover of the book? <laughs> yeah, so straight away. <laughs> There's been several other people who... Is he one of the guys in this picture, then? Yeah, it's the guy. Put your finger more to your left. To my left? Yeah, that's him there, that fellow there, yeah. That's the right. <laughs> and he's got <laughs> he's got a job out of it. Yeah, he's got a promotion out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I do like and, that. I do like... But and you touched on something there that, that's interesting is... is your families and and wives in particular can actually get inside what it is you were going through. So if you came home from a tour and they wanted to know why you were acting a particular way and they they can now, through the book, through the print version and the audio book, they can now see exactly what it was that you were dealing with. And I think that's I something think... I never thought of with, with the book. Um, I think yes and no, because it's, like I say, it's not my story. My story is the foundation, yes. It's good. The book's got to have structure. Yeah. But it's our story. There's about 20 interviews in there of several other people who there went are through good. Yeah. This, yeah. the same mud that I went through. And, you know, I don't believe there's any such thing as a self-made man because everybody needs help at some time, Joe, along, along the way. Yeah. And I've had a lot of help writing this book with these guys who've, who have been interviewing and they've been kind and just let me allow me to share their stories. Um. So for me, that's a big part of the book. It's a collaboration of what we went through. And, 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 I, and I don't think a book has ever been written like this before because especially in terms of the analytical, analytical aspect of it, whether it's the, whether, whether it used me a uh, political contemporary history degree and bring in the international dimension of what was going on there or whether I bring in uh, sort of like a post-revisionist view compared to an orthodox view at the time and try and make it completely uh, objective because sometimes we all believe we're a hero in our story where I'm more than aware that at times, whether intentional or not, I've become the villain. Um, and that's quite Who too? To a villain who up. too? Well, a villain to um, um, them poor women and children who got um, decimated yeah. in that airstrike, who we speak about earlier. Yeah. A villain to the um, the kids in the match in the bombing who I didn't have I feel personally I don't have the courage to help through speaking up because I'm still ashamed to admit there was PTSD. But th this is what I'm on about with PTSD. It doesn't go away, it's about how you manage it. So I manage mine by using that sort of negative experience to try and turn it into a positive to try and help other people. Yeah. Yeah. For a while in the book, for a little while in the book, you were shoulder to shoulder with uh, Americans and they had a different tour of duty set up to the Brits. Was their system better and, and what was the difference? Well, the Americans do a 12-month tour of duty uh, compared to the traditional British one, which is generally six to six to seven months, uh, sometimes bordering eight, depending on what role you've got in that unit move. So... Um, and they only have one two week break of R and R as well in between that, so you could be deployed for a month and get your two weeks R and R, and then straight away you, you, you've got like um, uh, 11, 11 months to push till, you, till you're home again. Now, in terms of welfare support, their system was years ahead of ours. Really, in terms of technology, yeah, they, they had a, uh, they basically had Google Maps in all their military vehicles, live Google Maps in 2007. So they were technology more advanced they had, the money they had was unbelievable. The resources they had was just next level. Uh, but welfare was a big one for me. Their welfare support package for their soldiers was 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 just maybe five or six times better than we'd, we'd ever received as British soldiers. And that comes back to the fact that they had a 12 month tour of duty compared to our traditional six month tour of duty. But it was leaps and bounds above us. And, and I think sometimes You've got to look what America's doing now in terms of their military and where we're going to be in five, ten years' time because what we tend to follow suit. Right. So it it should get better? I would like... To, the, see, the skeptic in me says no. Um, only two months ago, I was speaking to a serving warrant officer 
who was um, in the British Army, and he found post-operational stress management paperwork that had just been abandoned in a lecture theatre. So what post-operational stress management is, every soldier who goes on operations, they should have an interview on return within a month, and then at three months and six months. And yet again, he sit in a lecture theatre and he sign up for your mental health. And this paperwork that this particular unit, which I'm not going to name, was just left there, all signed, scattered all over this um, lecture theatre. When he'd gone in to give lecture his guys on, a, on, on some lesson, and they'd just left it all there. Just So st even now, there's no... Well, for, for me, it was always an umbrella exercise, whether it was uh, um, decompression, trim, trauma risk management, or post-operational stress management. It was a tick box umbrella exercise that was never really bought into. The concept was never really being forced or bought into by any active units in the British Army. Could that be because it was the old guard that get to make the rules and of how it is and stuff, and the the young your generation of fighting men were experiencing something slightly different to them? Well, I say that as to try and find a positive meaning that when your generation become the old guard and make the decisions, they're going to make better decisions or more relevant decisions about the welfare of soldiers. Well, no, I'm going to disagree with you there, Graham, because... Okay. Please do. I, don't the... I, I only read it out loud, mate. You lived it and wrote it. <laughs> the, the operational commitments, the reduction of our armed forces, everybody's doing two to three jobs. Right. So you've got to trim the fat somewhere. Um, and unfortunately, the lasting legacy of our prolonged uh, conflicts in Iraq and Af Afghanistan, in my opinion, was austerity, which had in turn reduced funding for our armed forces, yeah. which then caused redundancies, reduction in battalion numbers. Some battalions are no, are no longer. But demands have stayed the same. Yeah. So something's got to give. And unfortunately, what I experienced what I had to give was the welfare support that our soldiers received. Yeah. During and after. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yes. Right. So you, you mentioned you, you bury yourself in work to cope. Is that why you went and got the degree after you came out of the army? Was that more to cope with what you were dealing with or did you gen were you genuinely interested in what you were studying? Um. It's a couple of things. As a child, I was never encouraged to uh, do well at school because of, uh, of the adverse background that I grew up in. And I was always been fascinated by history. It was always what I used to call me the educated Neanderthal in the sergeant's mess <laughs> because I was always into politics. I was always into world issues. But then at the same time that night, I'd be in the bar getting drunk doing all kinds of silly antics. So it wasn't consistent, hence the educated Neanderthal. Um, now, when I left, the, when you leave the military, if you do, uh, depending on how long you've, you've done, you get you get a resettlement grant to retrain as a plumber, to retrain um, as an electrician. In my case, because I just had my back fuse six months prior, I couldn't do anything physically. Yeah. And I was, I, I, and I knew that I was going to go under a couple of years of intense rehabilitation. So, I thought, why not do something academic? And if the, if the Ministry of Defence is going to pay for me to go to university and, and achieve a degree. It was stupid not to. So I'm leaving the military then. I went and got a first class honours degree at Salford University. Congratulations. I'm, fact, a I'm a school ambassador there as well. <laughs> yeah. What would the 17 year old you think of that, do you reckon? Oh, you would never believe it. You'd never believe it. Well, did the military training help with the discipline of the study and everything, though? You I mean, there must be some positives that have come out of going through be, being a career soldier. Well, do you remember before I said there's no such thing as a self-made man? Mm. Well, some of these kids at 18, 19, 20 years old were so academically gifted, but a lot of them had lazy talent or didn't know how to nurture. So, um, you know, I, I just cracked on what I was doing in the military because I left as a welfare officer. I got these these guys in, uh, pushed them in the right direction, did a lot of group-led study. And I'm, I'm a big fan that knowledge of the group is far more superior than knowledge of the individual. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of like picking their brains as well and their ideas because they were they were a lot more academic than me. And that helped me to succeed. And I think as well, it also helped them to succeed as well. 
So what's next for James Paul Watson? I mean, you've done it all. You've served in Northern Ireland, Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan. You've been physically injured and operated on many times. You've studied, you've got a degree, you've written a book. It's now an audio book. You're quite the achiever. You really are. What else is still left to do? And you're a father. Goodness me. Yeah. Uh, it does. When you say it like that, it does sound quite impressive. It but, is impressive. I'm uh, impressed. For me, my priority now is always my family. Right. Um, they are now exclusively my mission as such. Um, and second to that, I just want to help veterans. I want to, one of the reasons why I wrote the book was to help veterans. And I just want to improve my local town for, for the next generation. And have a simple life. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a cracking book, which I read. And because I read it, you don't have to if you don't want to. You can listen to it as an audio book. You can download it from Audible. It's called Life After Death, A Guardsman's Tale by James Paul Watson. If you enjoy stories, gritty, real-life stories about uh, the military, you'll love it. If you enjoy hearing how somebody completely turned his life around from from being you know a kid who grew up in care w with a few issues and, and a few shall we say some dis discipline challenges would that be fair paul to to see to see the development of somebody like that into a man that anybody would be proud to call their friend uh, because you know I, i'm reluctant to use the word hero but you are so i'm going to say it anyway you know to be a military hero to do all those things and then to come out of it and to be to have issues and then to feel that you and your comrades were not given the respect and the support you needed afterwards but then to not just whine about it to get on and do a book about it as well as all the things that you do do hands on with the guys to help them out but to write a book to bring this story to the wider world it really is a terrific read it's a book that's got everything it really has got everything it's also and i think i mentioned this to you in a message it is a it is a living document of the of a history of the world of a of a, a particular time when these things were going on from an, an insider's perspective that hopefully in years and years to come people will study this and learn from it and try and make the world a better place and i am very honored to be your voice to to be able Graham, to read I, your I, I, words. Can't I can't stress enough how powerful your voice is <laughs> it's when the I words read, mate the words you gave me were the words when you I gave me the story. You're laughing, you know. When I'm upset and sad, it sounds like you're sad. Um, so I, I'm just overjoyed. I couldn't. I've, I've never, I've never done anything like this before. I was learning the ropes as we were going on. You, you were, great, you were great to guide me in every step of the way, which is brilliant. I just can't thank you enough because, like you say, when I was listening to my story, your story, your voice, how well and professional you are. I was like, bloody else is a good story, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> what happens next? <laughs> yeah, you spoiled your own ending. No, but it is. It, re it really is good, and it's an important book. And I hope you get the chance. And if you go to Audible, I'll put I'll put links in the description where you can click on Audible straight to where you can download the book and sign up for the the thirty days and get the book for free if you want if you want to check it out. You can, in fact, if you go down there now, you can hear samples of the book and everything. It's all linked on the same page, and decide what you want to do. Uh, James Paul Watson, Paul, thank you so much for letting me read your story and tell your story as an audio book, and continued success. And uh, just keep on helping people because it's just a brilliant story and it's an honor to be a tiny, tiny part of getting the word out there. Thank you.